Emotions Matter. Brought to you by ema.com. That's e m a w w dot com. Your solution for emotional intelligence. Welcome to the Emotions Matter podcast. I'm your host, Monique, and today I'd like to welcome a very special guest, Lavinia Planka. Lavinia is a body language expert and has helped people improve their movement, behavior, relationships, and careers for over 25 years. Her unique expertise connects the dots among posture, movement, emotions, and the mind. Lavinia's training and professional career have included theater dance, yoga, and the martial arts. She has taught the Feldenkrais Method for over 25 years and is a level CL4 teacher of the ALBA Method. She was an artist in residence for the Guggenheim Museum and movement consultant for theater and television companies around the world, from the Irish National Folk Theater to Nickelodeon. From Esalen to the Council on Aging, from Beijing to Mexico, Lavinia's popular workshops explore the intersection between movement, emotions, and the mind. She is currently the director of Asheville Movement Center in Asheville, North Carolina, offering a complete movement curriculum, including workshops and private lessons. Lavinia's writing includes several books and audio programs, as well as her popular column, Cosme Comedy. And now, I'd like to welcome Lavinia Planka. Hi, Lavinia. Hi. I'm so glad to be speaking with you tonight. Um, I have a very interesting question for you to start off with. I read a, a very long list of achievements uh, about your career, and I'm just curious, uh, of all of the things that you've done, what are you the most proud of? Well, you know, it's funny you should ask that because there's there's probably no one thing, but if you look at the sort of arc of my life, the one thing that I'm proud of is that I've always done what felt right for me. I've never tried to follow what I thought I should do because for some reason I'm not capable of it. So I don't know if I should be proud of it or not. <laughs> but But, you know, for my whole life, I've kind of bucked the system by always working for myself, by always doing what felt right. And that meant some very unusual choices. Not too many people choose to be a mime or a Feldenkrais teacher. And yet somehow I've made it work for myself. And I guess that's the thing I'm, I'm really proud of. So it's not necessarily just one thing. It's the fact that you've been able to make your life in the path that you wanted to take. Yeah. I mean, I believe everyone can do it, but somehow I actually did it. And that is that is remarkable. You're right. It takes a lot of tenacity and sacrifice and focus. So, And we're so glad that you did that because now you're here with us sharing your information. Um, now, you know, we had uh, Laura Bond, who is an um, ALBA method uh, instructor, a CL6, I believe, and um, I know you have worked with Laura Bond because you yourself are also certified. Is it CL4? Is that your certification level? Yes. And so my curiosity here is um, how did this relationship begin with you and Laura? How did you find each other? Well, actually, we found each other at a party. And, you know, Laura Bond, when I met her, was a professor at UNCA, which she still is now, the University of North Carolina, Asheville. And we were introduced to each other and she said, so what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a Feldenkrais teacher. And she went, oh. <laughs> and I said, so what do you do? And she said, well, I'm an ALBA teacher and a drama teacher. And I went, oh. <laughs> and we both kind of we both kind of looked at each other because 
you know, she had experienced some Feldenkrais classes in college that had not exactly thrilled her. Mm. And I had read about the Alba method and it had not thrilled me. So we're both sort of sitting there staring at each other at this party going, should we like each other? (laughs) Um, And then because of the fact, because of the fact that Laura is such a sort of dynamic and interesting person and so open, she invited me to try again by teaching a Feldenkrais class to one of her drama classes at UNCA, where she discovered that, oh, Feldenkrais actually had some potential. And then in exchange, I began to study a little bit of ALBA with her and the rest is history. We really realized that these two methods uh, work really well together. And uh, I don't know about Laura, but I have continued to learn from her through the years, both so much about ALBA as well as its applications to my work as a Feldenkrais teacher. I call that the Reese's Cup syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> it's where you take two unlikely things and you put them together to create one wonderful new thing. And so, yeah, and I can yeah. attest to that because I have, I have been witness to, to that relationship and to, to both of your teaching styles. And uh, I can't think of one without the other. And yet you both also exist independently from each other. So it's a wonderful. Now, um, you've taught Feldenkrais uh, method for over 25 years. Can you tell us a little bit about it? I'm familiar with it, but I know that many of our listeners probably are not. And so this is an opportunity to uh, give them some information on this method and and maybe something that they could seek out themselves. I'm thrilled to be able to tell you about it. You know, it's interesting. I I just taught a workshop uh, up in Boone this past weekend where a couple of people signed up because there was nothing else left for them to sign up for. And they kept calling it the Feldenkrais method. And so that's how un, unwell known Feldenkrais is, but it's spelled F E L D E N K R A I S. And we like to say that Feldenkrais rhymes with paradise. Ah. Because, ah, because when you do the movements that are associated with Feldenkrais lessons, you feel like you're floating on air a lot of times. So to go all the way back, uh, the Feldenkrais method is named after its founder. His name was Moshe Feldenkrais, Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais. And he was a martial artist, a physicist, an engineer. He worked with the Curies. And over the course of time, he developed this method Uh, in order to actually rehabilitate himself from his own injuries during a time when surgery was not a great option for for recovering from injury. And the method itself is sort of based on all of these different ideas, biomechanics, engineering, uh, neurology, physics, martial arts. He put it all together into a system where you can learn movement through group lessons or one-on-one that helps you become a more functional individual. Whether you play tennis, whether you've had an injury, whether you're a dancer, or in your case, an actor, you can learn to be more effective, more spontaneous, more present in your body through these movements, which are done mostly lying down, very slow, very meditative, giving you an opportunity to connect your brain, your body, your emotions in every aspect of what you do. And I should say, you know, I say your body, but that includes your breath, that includes your your inner functions, it includes everything. Okay, well, now that kind of brings me to my next question then. Uh, how does it, how does this method actually connect all of those things you mentioned, like the movement and the posture? the emotions and mind, what is at the root here that allows people to make that connection? Is it a specific movement? Is it how they, you know, do the exercise? What is it that makes it unique in tying all these things together? Well, 
I don't know that it's unique because anything could do it. It's attention or awareness that links all these things together. But if you think about it for a moment, right, your body and your brain are, well, Feldenkrais said they were the same thing. In fact, he once said there is no mind-body connection. Your mind and your body are the same thing. Mm. So if you look at your body as an information system that's constantly sending impulses back and forth, back and forth all over, then by movement is something that we're doing all the time, right? In every moment you're moving, even when you're sitting in meditation, there's movement going on in the sense of the beating of your heart, your breath, the way you shift, there's always movement going on. And Basically, how you move is how you move through life. So if you move in a, in a tense way, if you move in a relaxed way, if you move in, um, in a rushed way, all of those things reflect in your emotional life, in your um, thinking, in everything. In fact, Feldenkrais once said that we are always moving, thinking, sensing, and feeling at the same time, he called them the four components of action, that it's all going on all the time. Uh, of course, we're not aware of that most of the time. I mean, if you're in a deep emotion, of course, you might at one moment or another go, wow, I'm really angry. But most of the time, we're not aware of those things taking place. So through awareness, through movement, which is what Feldenkrais called his group classes, you slow everything down so that you can attend you can attend to the tension in your shoulders. You can attend to the way you hold your breath. And you can attend to emotions that come up for you so that you become more and more aware of how you carry yourself through life. Mm. So then would you say that if we're all sort of this one unit, really, and we, you said we, we carry our movement through our life and, and handle our life uh, through the way we move, meaning that that perception that we're giving off tends to ignite certain circumstances or situations uh, or reactions from people. Uh, do you think then that the emotions that we carry uh, can really be physicalized in everything that we do? Uh, you know, can or or vice versa? If I want to change myself emotionally and I switch a movement or do something physically different, that that will indeed influence that emotion to change or alter? Well, I think it can help. And that's very much what the album method uh, talks about it by teaching people the various patterns of emotions and learning how to master those patterns. You can uh, uh, sort of access them through that process. Feldenkrais works a little bit differently in that it tries to bring you back to a place of presence. So it's not like when you're, when you're doing a Feldenkrais lesson, you're not trying necessarily to shift your emotional state, but you learn how to become aware of where you are habitually holding that might be related to habitual emotional postures that you're carrying when you're moving through life. So in Feldenkrais lessons, we sort of even the playing field. You're lying down 90% of the time. So you're not fighting gravity and you're not relating to other people. You're not forced into a social situation. And it brings you to a place of, of quiet and neutrality where you can observe how you are and in that process, reorganize the way you carry yourself so that when you come to vertical, you're in a more responsive versus reactive state. And then you have access to choose how to be. Do I want to be uh, in, in an emotional reaction? Do I want to be quiet? Do I, so, so to me, the two can work very well together because if I'm relaxed and I'm present after doing Feldenkrais and then an emotion is called for, I have the pattern from Alba that I could choose in that moment. 
or I could just choose to be present. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but no, you are. You're making absolute sense. Uh, the, the the objectives are different in those two methods, yet they uh, combined can really help each other in in the sense of awareness. Yeah, right, mm -hmm. right. So so with Feldenkrais, it's it's about finding a way to be the most functional self you can be the most present self you can be the most, you know, sort of relaxed and responsive and spontaneous self you can be. And that's all wonderful and, and helps you move through life. But then with Alba, you can begin to recognize when anger creeps up or when someone else is acting in a certain way. And then your improved functionality from Feldenkrais can support you as you try to do the other emotional patterns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that you, you know, well, let, let me ask it this way. With the Feldenkrais method, who tends to uh, benefit from it the most? Is it people who have a personal injury or, uh, you know, or is this something that can, can benefit really anybody? Well, of course, I believe that it can benefit anybody, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but Generally, the people that come for Feldenkrais classes, uh, at least initially, are people who are either in pain or have some kind of an injury where they've tried everything else. I mean, let's face it, it's not covered by insurance. You can't pronounce it. And it's hard to explain. Yeah. So, <laughs> you, you know, so, so, the, so the people who come generally either have heard that it really helped a friend of theirs or they've tried everything else. And generally they come in the beginning because of pain or an injury, but then as they get more deeply involved in it, they start to see how it improves uh, emotional well-being, it improves clarity of thinking, it allows you to, again, be more responsive to situations. So it's like they come because of physical pain. And then once the physical pain becomes more, um, the body becomes more organized, then everything else becomes more organized because the body is the mind and the mind is the body. Mm. So if, if the pain in my shoulder that hasn't gone away in spite of physical therapy and, and shots and all that other kind of stuff, starts to go away. And suddenly I also recognize that, wow, I'm not as angry anymore. There's, you know, there's a correlation there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because certainly if you live in pain, that can't feel good. And when you're not physically feeling good, that can put you in a sort of a state of depression or anger, uh, frustration, certainly. And then, you know, learning how to ease that up or let go of it. Um, can help you then focus on the other things that might be uh, needing adjustment. Because like you said, it's like the whole body has to rebalance itself. You know, if, you're, if the whole body is shifted to compensating a part of your, of your muscle or your system, then everything gets off alignment. Right. But also vice versa. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you are living in anxiety or fear or anger, that's going to manifest as pain. Hmm. Ultimately, ultimately something's, something's got to give. And so a lot of times people don't realize, for example, that their frozen shoulder or their lower back pain is related to an anxiety pattern. That's what Feldenkrais called it. He called it a, an anxiety posture pattern that is invisible to us because we don't associate our emotions with our postures. Hmm. Yeah, I remember you had, um, I think it was a, a video of, talking about the pelvis area. And I remember you demonstrating that in the video. Uh, what do you have? The, do you know the link of that video? Is that is that actually available on YouTube? Oh, yeah, it is. I would have to look it up. Well, um, I mean, maybe maybe at some point uh, in our talk, you, you might be able to find it just to share it with the uh, with the listeners, because it's a really neat video <laughs> and you get to see Lavinia do her performances in there. But it's so true. The way we carry our pelvic area can really influence how people perceive us, you know, as being either confident or being sexual or being asexual 
you know, uh, or being promiscuous. Uh, yeah. Or being, up, or being uptight. Or being or uptight. Yeah. Aggressive. There's so many levels of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's really fascinating. And, and out of a curiosity, uh, just out of curiosity, what is the longest relationship a client has had with you? You know, like, who is your well, longest client? You know, I've had two, two different sets of careers, right? Because I lived in New Jersey for several years, and then I've lived in Asheville for 15. So I have a couple of students. So students, clients, right? There's, we, we, we call our clients students. Okay. Because, because Feldenkrais is not a therapy. We don't fix people. We teach people. Ah. We, we teach people how to take care of themselves. We teach people how they can make themselves feel better. And so, and it's taught in two different ways, right? We teach in groups and then we teach one-on-one. -on -one. So since I've been in Asheville, I have actually two students who started with me like about a month after I moved here 15 years ago, who still come to class, which is awesome to me. Wow. Uh, they're both in their late eighties and they're amazing women. <laughs> they're really amazing. So you and said they're, I, they're in their late eighties. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yes. Yes. They are awesome. And, um, and then I also have a, a client that I see one-on-one -on -one actually twice a week, a wonderful woman who, um, has MS. She's actually been doing Feldenkrais as long as I have. Uh, she started out back in Seattle and I've been seeing her twice a week for 10 years. Wow. We, we were just talking about that today, you know, so she comes because it's what keeps her mobile. She credits the Feldenkrais method. She's almost 80 with being able to be an, a, a, a lively functional person, even though she can't walk. Wow. Um, that's so amazing. Look, I, I have I have this link for the video. Should I? It's it's like yeah. a YouTube link, so it's very complicated. Can I send it to you, or do you want me to actually say it? Yeah, you probably it, have to say it. But uh, it is so but, long. <laughs> <laughs> well, what? Well, is it like a long number? Well, I tell it's you one what. Of those YouTube links, you know. Well, what's the title? Because they can always just look at it up with the oh, title. I can tell you the title. It's called "Meet Your Pelvis." <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now, be careful what other videos <laughs> might pop up <laughs> right, exactly. in your search. Do not do this with young children in the room. <laughs> but yeah, that'll be easier to find. It's yeah. Meet Your Pelvis. And my name. And your there's name, only, Lavinia Plunk. Probably only one pelvis video with my name. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> that is great. Um, okay, let me ask you this since we've we've sort of been touching here about the emotions of course um you had mentioned something about anger earlier and holding anger from your experience uh where do people tend to hold their anger you know physically and um what are some ways that you might have recognized that in someone or they have recognized it in themselves and a tool or a method from the Feldenkrais that helped them relieve it? I mean, is it, you know, is it a, a slow pro process? Do you have very specific exercises that help them trigger that? Are you even going for the idea of the emotion or are you going more for the physical? Well, when I work with people, uh, generally something like that would happen in a one-on-one -on -one situation, which is what we call functional integration, right? Uh, I, I, and I don't really, like I have very mixed feelings about the name of the one-on-one -on -one sessions because on a certain level, it's a wonderful title. I am helping people become more functional, integrate themselves and become more functional. But it's such a mouthful <laughs> yeah. that that sometimes it, it's kind of intimidating when people hear that, oh, well, I'm going to be functionally integrated. <laughs> um, it's, yeah. it's, it's actually very rare that a person will come to me and say, I have anger issues. Because most of the time, anger is something that we are unwilling or unable to see in ourselves. And so again, usually what happens 
for me is that a person will come and present themselves as having, you know, tremendous neck and shoulder tension, for example, or migraines or uh, problems with their arms. And as I am working with them, I begin to start to see that they're exhibiting some of the patterns, right? And you, I know you've studied ALBA and that's where ALBA becomes very handy in terms of um, understanding the tensions in the face mm -hmm. that people carry. Um, and then a lot of times, of course, people are angry, but they've covered it over with other stuff so that you don't necessarily see anger. You might see depression, you might see sadness, you might see all other kinds of things that are, that are covering up a core of anger that's somewhere in the ribs, tightness in the ribs and in the solar plexus area because they're holding it all in, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but most often, most often I experience uh, working with people's anger in the shoulder girdle area, especially behind the shoulder blades and in the levators, the, 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 the muscles right at the top of the neck by the trapezius area. Mm -hmm. And so I will generally work with them to help them find strategies for releasing that and for finding a different way of breathing. Mm. And through that process, again, with Feldenkrais, it's like we never, like I would never say, wow, you have, you're angry, man, <laughs> you know? But we don't, we, don't ever, we don't ever point out to somebody something that they haven't told us already. That's one of the beauties of the Feldenkrais method. You know, uh, I might notice something like someone's walking really stooped over and I won't say, whoa, you really have rounded shoulders. Instead, I'll say, well, what do you notice about your shoulders right now? And, mm -hmm. it, you know, and they'll just sometimes people will say, oh, well, they're just fine. And I'll be like, OK, that person is not aware <laughs> of how they carry themselves. And that's important information yeah. for me yeah. as I begin to work with them. So many, many times people will come, for example, and say that they have like neck problems. And I'll think to myself, yeah, you've got a real pain in the neck going on in your life right now. But I won't say that because they don't know that that's where it's coming from. They need to discover it. They need to discover it through movement. So as we move together, and literally we move together, I move them, they move, and they begin to start to see how much holding and tension is going on in the shoulders and the ribs and the breath. And when it lets go, that's when they suddenly go, wow, I was, I was really angry. Ah. You know, they, they discover it or, or they'll say something like, wow, I feel so much better now. I, I think I'm going to go talk to my husband, ah. you know? So, so it's like it, it passes through and, and just like Alba, it passes past any sort of psychoanalysis. It's a somatic experience that just clarifies who you are and you can move on. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So you don't, you know, superimpose any ideas upon them either, which is great. Uh, and their self-discovery becomes that much more important and, and real to them. Because how many times can, you know, you've, you've been told by somebody else you should do this or why are you do this or blah, blah. And then you kind of shut them out. As right. though you don't know, you don't know me, you don't know what's going on, you know, and we, we, we shut those people out. But when we finally make that realization on our own, that's when change happens. Exactly. And I try to, you know, I mean, I respect every person who comes in, they come in, you know, as who they are, who they are. I mean, it's taken a lifetime mm -hmm. to be who you are. And it's not up to me to say to somebody, well, you, you know, you really got to get rid of that attitude. <laughs> you know? Right. Right. You know? um, so, and it's, and it's always different. It's always different. A lot of people, a lot more people come to me because they're carrying wounds, mm. emotional wounds, um, you know, or, or physical wounds that have led to emotional wounds. And, and that's just sitting there in the anxiety pattern in their bodies. Now, you said something uh, about 
uh, sadness er earlier. Do those do those two emotions like like grief or sadness and anger? Do they tend to be harboring in the same vicinity, or do you find there's enough of a difference to distinguish the two and, and kind of help them out of that pattern? Well, most of our emotions, in one way or another, connect up to our breathing patterns and how how the ribs and shoulders manifest themselves. Um, so, you know, each person's going to be a little bit different. Uh, I'm trying to think of the right way to answer that question. You know, for example, somebody could come to me and be very rounded over and they could have anger. Hmm. Be, you know, so even though they look from the outside as if they're depressed, there's a core of anger underneath there. So, you know, it, it, it's not, it's not something that to, I don't like to just look at somebody and try to label them. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, the, the, the carriage of the emotions comes from somewhere in the torso. And of course, in the face, sometimes you can see it in the hands and the feet, but it's, you know, it's basically the torso and the face. Mm. Hmm. Do you think with anger and let's say if we just stick with the anger and grief, what is the relationship with the pelvis in that sense? Is it, are we more cut off from our from our pelvic area then? Because since you said it's mostly the torso, do we tend to get very rigid from the pelvis down? Well, you know, the pelvis the pelvis is part of your torso. So there's going to be a connection to your emotional life in some way to your pelvis. The pelvis would be more dealing with super visceral kind of emotional reactions as opposed to, you know, kind of habitual holdings. Although I'm going to, you know, just go a little bit deeper and perhaps I don't know if this is going to be great for your audience, but you know, we have our pelvic floor, and we have the sphincters that are down at the bottom of our pelvic floor. And those sphincters very much participate in various emotional situations. We even have expressions, for example, she's such a tight ass, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, just to, just to be very generalizing about it, but tensions can be held in the pelvic floor area and of course, in the lumbar area, the lumbo lumbosacral area, where the, the spine starts to meet the pelvis. And so, but those tensions are generally related to, you know, you haven't mentioned the ever popular emotion of fear. Yeah. Fear, anxiety, uh, you know, all of that is there. Plus anyone who has ever had any experience, any kind of abuse or, or any sort of issues in their lower regions will be carrying old emotional scars there. Mm -hmm. So the pelvis is definitely a repository as well as an, a, an expression mm -hmm. of, of certain very deep, deep emotional stuff. Mm. And, and I have to be very careful and very respectful mm. whenever, whenever I begin working with someone and realize that, oh yes, something's going on there because you know, who knows? Yeah. One, one has to just be very, very kind and, and careful and allow that opening or relaxation to take place on its own. Yeah. You know, um, the, the, there, there's a saying that uh, in, in language, for example, that when we, when we deal with phonemes and we think of consonant sounds, that those are head-centered so sounds. Those are sounds for thinking. You know, this mm -hmm. gives us clarity in our thought. But vowel sounds are open sounds, and those are related to our emotions. And mm -hmm. usually you, when you're teaching, let's say, voice and diction, you try to open up their bellies and their pelvic area, you know, to say the, to say the words that have more of these vowel sounds because they seem to be more connected, you know, deep down versus the consonants, which are more focused on your articulators, you know, your jaw, your facial, your head, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and so, like you said, we use these expressions all the time. And, and when you were talking about the sphincter muscle, I, the first thing that popped into my mind was Freud, you know, and, and, and also course. and also talking about children when you're potty training them, mm -hmm. you know, and the whole sense of control 
and letting go of that control. And it's all right. part of that sphincter muscle. <laughs> You're trying right. to get him to release that control and, and to trust. Right. right. To trust that relaxation that everything's going to be fine. But yeah. Yeah. But it's very inter- powerful. Yeah. And interesting what you're speaking about in terms of the vowels, when you think about profound emotions, like, you know, you mentioned grief, you know, the first moment of grief, the shock or the horror or whatever it is that takes place in the moment of seeing something or hearing that something horrible has happened that is in the pelvis, right? Mm -hmm. That the whole, everything in the pelvis just lets go and the scream comes out. I'm I'm thinking of Guernica, you know, Picasso's Guernica. Mm -hmm. That the whole body actually becomes a vessel for transmitting this uh, keening, this scream. Mm -hmm. And then other stages of grief come in. But that, you know, or, or in a moment of absolute terror of seeing the boogeyman, you know, we even, again, another typical English expression. I was so scared I peed in my pants, right? Mm-hmm. That is actually a visceral emotional reaction that's happening from the pelvis, mm. you know, mm-hmm. and, and then it moves up as we start to sort of control it, humanize it, sublimate it, somaticize it, however you want to describe it. It moves up. Mm-hmm. It moves up in a way to almost uh, distract the viewer. You know, like like a mother, like a mother bird on its nest. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've been known to to leave the nest and start limping, you know, right. and look injured right. to right. kind of right. draw you away from her most precious thing. And right. you know, and in some ways, maybe we do that physically, unconsciously. I'm going to to like you said, suppress whatever trauma or issue, and I'm going to bring it away from that and overcompensate perhaps mm-hmm. maybe maybe i mean we're all different yeah you know mm-hmm. yeah the, the danger of always talking about these things <laughs> it's like reading a medical you know textbook you, you don't feel good so you go online and you go to you know med doc med doctor <laughs> dot com <laughs> and then you have all yeah, you have all those illnesses. And that's the same when whenever you're studying acting or any kind of movement like this. And you start looking at people and you go, oh, they, <laughs> they've had trauma. And maybe we start, you know, uh, superimposing uh, <laughs> these discoveries on others. So we do we do need a disclaimer here uh, well, that we need to emphasize that, that it is an individual experience. There, there's some relationship, but you, you can't discount that everybody has their own individual experience and that's why i never uh i never try to jump to conclusions because uh, you know i don't know the whole story and why i try to meet every person where they are and just pay attention to both the the words that they're telling me their body language and then honoring whatever pain or situation has brought them to me Mm-hmm. You know, and, and just try to be present to that without trying to figure out what's happening. Mm-hmm. It just reveals itself. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 smart uh, on many levels, yeah. on many levels. Uh, in fact, I remember uh, when I was in graduate school and I was a teaching assistant and we were told that when we start teaching acting classes, that we have to be very careful uh, when we're conducting any kind of physical things, even if it's for posture alignment, for example, don't touch the student. And we were all like, what? Why can't we touch it? How are we going to do it? We can't touch the student. And they warned us. They said, "You muscle has memory. I'll just remember this. They always said, muscle has memory. And you never know. You might just gently tap them on their shoulder and you might trigger something, especially if you're oh, yeah. working on their posture and you might not be able to handle what comes comes that, that follows. Well, when they come to see me, they are assuming that I will touch them. Yeah, they know that. Right. right. And do you tell them up front? We're going to I'm going to put my hand here. I mean, do you, you know, just kind of it depends on yeah. the person. Yeah, it totally depends on the person. And and by the way, there are people that come for private lessons that I don't touch because they are so fragile. Mm-hmm. But but that's that's discussed in mm-hmm. advance. And we know 
And so, and so there are some people who are also um, just very uh, keyed up and high wired. And I do have to let them know I'm going to your knee now. I'm going mm-hmm. to your shoulder now. Mm-hmm. But other people just kind of, you know, they let go, they relax, they trust, and they know I'm not going to do anything. Right. To them. Yeah. You know, and yeah. then and then it's okay. And then it can proceed in a silent fashion where they're following with their awareness and I'm following with my awareness. And it's it's quite lovely. It is. It is. Let me ask you, uh, so I know you've had several published books, but let me ask you, of the books that you've published which are all great, by the way, um, and your CDs that you have out there. Of all of those, which one would you recommend to our listeners as as a way of introduction or, you know, that might benefit them from from hearing this podcast? Well, I really think it depends on what their um, wishes are or their interests are. Because, you know, uh, one of my books is called What Are You Afraid Of? And it's a body-mind approach to courageous living. And so if you're a person that is struggling with fear and anxiety issues, that book specifically targets that sort of series of emotional uh, reactions and anxiety responses and how to use a somatic approach to fear, anxiety, nervousness, phobias, that kind of, uh, that, that aspect of emotion. And, and it's very focused on that, where walking your talk is an introduction to the whole idea of the body as a communicating instrument. And that through walking your talk, you can kind of be introduced to different ways that different parts of our bodies manifest emotions and then how to work with that. But it covers the full range of emotions. Uh, there's even there's even even though I had barely begun working with Laura at that point, there is even a, a brief bit about Alba in there. Huh. But but it focuses mostly on other uh, more ancient and traditional approaches to body language in in conjunction with Feldenkrais. So to me, walking your talk is like if you're an actor, if and and I've heard from lots of actors around the world who use this book as a text for themselves to to break down emotions and work from the outside in or if you're a person who's interested in a a general overview of how the body manifests emotions then walking your talk is the way to go if you're someone who's struggling with fear anxiety nervousness then i would say go for what are you afraid of Mm -hmm. you know because because that is a very practical book with practical exercises to help overcome you know, something that is the bane of our existence, the fear fear that paralyzes us and keeps us from doing what we want in our lives. Yeah, yeah. Even for improving ourselves or for, you know, speaking out or for seeking that job, it's it's definitely rooted in fear, sure. Exactly. Because, you know, I mean, fear is an important survival strategy. We need it, but it has become something that paralyzes so many people so that they can't do what they want in life. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, I agree. Uh, I do have a listener who has written in um, a question here. So let's look at what the question is. Oh, it's Neil from London. Hello, London. Uh, And Neil says that he wants to know how much exercise is enough to achieve perfect mental balance. So... What does that mean? Perfect. Because perfect, you know, I, I, Feldenkrais once said, you know, once once you're perfect, you're done. You Hmm. know, then you you don't have to live anymore because there's nothing more to learn. Hmm. And to me, life is about a continual learning process. So, you know, and life is constantly, it's, it's almost as if life has this ulterior motive of let's see how many different ways I can take you out of balance. (laughs) <laughs> right. And so to me, it's not about trying to live in perfect mental balance, but it's about how can I be resilient enough to recover my balance in any sort of situation? And, and actually, you know, the I'm trying to think of, I guess it was St. Luke's Hospital. They were de- defining uh, health as resilience and the ability to recover from shock. 
because shocks are going to come to us all the time. And so, you, you know, you might think, oh, I have, I have perfect mental balance. I have it <laughs> under control. And then, you know, something happens and you get knocked upside the head. How do you recover? And to me, that's not about exercise. And I think Neil is asking how much exercise and, and, you know, to define what is exercise for every single person. I mean, to one person, exercise is going to the gym. To another person, exercise is going for, you know, long walks in the woods. To another person, uh, you know, exercise is going to a yoga class. So how could you define what is the perfect exercise for every human being? We are so unique, each of us, in terms of how we respond to movement, how we take in pleasure and movement. And so uh, as much as I'd like to tell Neil that there's like a formula, it's really more about paying attention to yourself and, pay, and noticing what it, is, what it is that I need in any given moment in order to feel right, in order to feel like I'm, I'm moving and learning in a, in a way that's, that's keeping me, again, spontaneous, attentive, and ready to move in any direction. You know, Feldenkrais actually, um, he, def he created a word that I love that somehow it hasn't caught on. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's called, it, the word is called acture. Spell it. A-C-T-U-R-E. So as an actor, you'd be interested in acture, uh -huh. but it was because he felt that posture implied a certain static state you know that this is this is the proper posture one should have um or in you know this is the perfect balance that you are but he felt that acture was a way of looking at myself in movement and that good acture would be someone who had the ability to be able to respond to any situation from any position at any time, right? So to me, that's pretty close to this idea of perfect mental balance, but it's really about being able to be taken off balance and recovering. Mm. So, you know, uh, martial arts yep. would be useful. Mm -hmm. um, lots of Feldenkrais. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But, but again, you know, like I said, it's, it's, it's this tricky word of exercise because what is exercise for each person? It's going to be individual. Yeah. I think I'm going to call this the, the weeble syndrome. Do you remember, the weeble syndrome. you yes, remember the weebles? Follow, but, weebles. No, but they don't fall down. <laughs> well, and, and so maybe that's not right because we do fall down. And so, All the time. which is why you said martial arts was great because I, in fact, I had this com conversation with someone not too long ago about how martial arts teaches you how to get back up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> because most of the time you, they spend teaching you how, how to fall, you know, and falling so that you don't injure yourself because you're, you're likely to fall in some kind of, you know, altercation or, or fight. And when you're down, you got to get back up or you may That's not right. get up. So, yeah, good point. Yeah. That's why my latest book is called The Little Book of Falling and Getting Up Again. <laughs> See that? That was a great lead in because my next question is. <laughs> I did not know your next question. Yeah, okay? Well, here's my next question is where can we read, hear or see more of you? That is my question. Oh, that's perfect. So, well, of course, uh, you can always visit my website, which is just my name, LaviniaPlanka.com. Okay, LaviniaPlanka.com. And they may not know how to spell it, uh, L-A-V-I-N-I-A-P-L-O-N-K-A. -A. That's right. So that's probably the easiest place to find more of me. Yeah, you have all the books that you've published, plus workshops, and you also post a blog every now and then correct i do i have um i actually have a email newsletter that i send out about once a month with with a blog post in it i'm not so great all the time about putting it on my website but if people are on my newsletter list uh, i don't spam people i actually send useful information <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and and I do and I do periodically put it on my website, but I I do write a lot, and um, I can like they to share? Can they join your news? Can they be placed on yeah, that all newsletter? They have to do is go to my website. Okay, yeah, they so they can sign up for it. Yeah, okay, well, absolutely. great. Well, Lavinia, I can't tell you how happy I am that we got to talk today, uh, and that we got to share this wonderful information with our listeners. I hope they will go and, and learn more about it or be grateful if they're already in a relationship with, uh, with Feldenkrais uh, and, uh, and absorb that because it, it, it really is a wonderful, uh, I'm going to say, technique or method uh, to help you, as, as we were saying, move through life, you know, freely openly, spontaneously, and with resilience, because we can't avoid all the things that happen to us. We can only learn how to react to it, you know, or not react to it, I guess. Respond to it. How's Respond that? to it. Yes. We can't help but react. But, right. but as, as we become more aware, we begin to recognize when the reaction is um, not functional, mm -hmm. when it's not supporting, you know, my, my, my growth. Right. Yes, perfect. Well, Monique, it's been it's 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 been an a, an honor, really. I really really enjoy speaking with you. Oh, I always enjoy speaking with you, Lavinia. It's always a great time, and I always learn so much. So I'm so glad we were able to share you with our audience. With that, thank you for joining my guest, Lavinia Planca, and me, your host, Monique, on the Emotions Matter podcast.